Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Atkins. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which the Camperdown campus of the University of Sydney stands, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Sovereignty over this land was never ceded, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So welcome to this, our very first webinar in a series of three <clears throat> focusing on the transformative power of the arts and the social sciences. In this series, we're going to feature prominent alumni from our faculty. And today I'm very pleased to welcome three such alumni, Seamus Tardiff, Trudy Harriman and Angus Mitchell. And they're all going to talk to us today um, on the theme of it's an employee's market, reinventing yourself for the career you want. Now, I'm going to pose um, a series of questions to our guests, and there'll be plenty of time afterwards for, uh, for questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A function, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen for writing your questions out, and then we can ask them to our guests at the end. So what I'd like to do now is to turn to our prominent alumni, um, Seamus, Trudy, and Angus, um, and ask them to introduce themselves briefly. So over to you first, um, Seamus. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining with us. So my name is Seamus Tardif. Um, I started my, uh, my academic career in, uh, at the University of Sydney doing a Bachelor of Arts, double major in Art, History and Literature, um, uh, and did an honours uh, honors degree after that with, um, with Art History. So I started, I guess, in the fairly typical way of arts, uh, particularly for Art History, of moving into the art world. Um, I'd done a few internships in galleries in Sydney, um, and then uh, across in New York. Um, and after having finished my, uh, my honours degree, I actually moved across the UK to go and work for an auction house called Bonhams, where I started off first as a porter and then into the role of specialist, um, but eventually actually got brought back into Australia to work on their operational side uh, of the business. Uh, which itself was an amazing learning experience to go from learning about, um, uh, you know, arts into then going to logistics, uh, you know, profit and loss statements and working out how I can try and save the business as much money as possible. Um, so from there, I actually came back to the, the University of Sydney to do a master's degree in, in management, um, which was really looking at a broad spectrum of subjects from uh, you know, corporate finance and accounting through to strategy and innovation, uh, even to cross-cultural management, sort of the, the key pillars that, that were thought um, to be required for, for sort of getting into management. And what that actually led me to was sort of two paths into one part entrepreneurialism and another part into um, working in, in the consulting space. So I actually started working for um, some boutique um, uh, design thinking firms and for me, this was uh, an awesome blend of the two areas of kind of the, the um, expansive thinking that you get in terms of arts uh, and the, the, the critical thinking nature of arts. And then the sort of the, the hardcore sort of frameworks that, that come from a business degree. And so for me, this was a natural blend of those two things that, that I started to work towards. After a couple of years there, um, I fell a bit more in love in terms of entrepreneurialism, uh, ended up launching my own business in the event tech space. Uh, and that took me down the path of digital, uh, whereas previously I had worked a lot with physical goods. Um, I uh, realized that, look, there is a, a massive world out there from a digital standpoint. I mean, we all live and breathe it every day. Zoom here is an example of that. Um, and that found me starting to work for a, a large consulting firm called Boston Consulting Group, uh, specifically for their digital venturing arm. Uh, their digital venturing arm's core remit is to, um, is to invent, build and scale game-changing businesses alongside the world's largest organizations and corporations. And so breaking that down, what that means is we were building businesses for uh, huge companies and huge organizations directly alongside their C-suite 
um, uh, which meant that we were tackling kind of the biggest problems at hand. And once again, that was being sort of thrown into a world that wasn't necessarily what I had planned out from my uh, initial uh, initial degree, but whose skills I could kind of bring forth into that, that ability to deal with large scale ambiguity, the ability to be able to sort of tie disparate ideas together in order to be able to find uh, those true grains of, uh, of opportunity. Um, and, um, uh, and then the business framework, once again, to be able to have that parlance of, of the business world. So during, uh, during my time with DV, I had the pleasure of launching three businesses, um, working across uh, Southeast Asia. And um, now one of the businesses that, uh, that we launched, I've actually stepped into as the head of growth. So working in the agricultural technology space, um, I sit on the senior leadership team. Um, our company is around about 400, 450 people now. Uh, and getting to blend once again that idea of uh, very large scale ambiguity with those frameworks from, from, a, um, from a business standpoint in order to be able to navigate very uncertain times uh, and uh, a very uncertain landscape. Um, so that's kind of the, the very quick nutshell uh, of, of my career story to date and looking forward to talking more about it throughout. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Seamus. Um, excellent summary. And we're looking forward to digging deeper into kind of those themes of ambiguity and um, navigation. So let's throw now to Trudy. Over to you, Trudy. Hi there. You got me? Fantastic. Um, hi, everybody. I'm talking to you from um, the land of the Gadigal, or Gadigal land um, of the Eora Nation as well. I live a stone's throw from Sydney Uni. I haven't gone very far from when I went to Sydney Uni. So my name is Trudy Harriman. Um, I am a Sydney native very much so. Um, I've always lived on Gadigal land and went through um, Sydney Girls High School into Sydney University. Um, my path to university wasn't one where I came from a family of people who um, had traditionally gone through into tertiary education and um, going through careers counselling in high school was really interesting. I think I put the conundrum to him that I really liked economics, but I liked people and I wasn't quite sure what that might mean for me. And he had suggested studying Bachelor of Economics at Sydney University, um, but looking to major in a few areas that he thought might talk a little bit more to the people um, side that I was really interested in as well. So um, I ended up graduating with a major in economics, but also in human resources and industrial relations management. I did the undergraduate um, stream of honours, but um, had found myself halfway through third year following a very good friend who knew all about careers fairs and, and what Sydney University put on there from an expo perspective and found myself putting in um, resumes to graduate programs and ended up taking a graduate role and not completing my honours year. So um, the graduate program that I took was in human resources and I've found myself doing that now for more than 20 years, which is a good carbon dating um, for me as well. And I've worked across a number of industries, always in um, the field of HR, but similar to the changes that we've seen go through um, across our community, but also socially and, and absolutely as it relates to business, that's morphed more from what was more of a traditional employer relations area into what I think now is much more of a change and transformation focus as um, human resources professionals need to really adjust to you know, less about the skill and, and the knowledge or experience that we bring to the table in that technical sense, but much more in that how we look at the broader people lens and what we're doing to support people as they transition in a dramatically changing economy. Uh, and so I tend to say that now my focus is very much more around change and transformation. So the industries that I've worked um, across, I started out in FMCG, spent 11 years at Coca-Cola Amatil, um, which is now Coca-Cola Euro Pacific, I think it is. I went into Qantas for seven years. Um, I was the CPO at Craveable Brands uh, for three years, which is a private equity-owned business that has uh, a few quick service restaurant brands, um, Australian origin. And most recently, so in January, I joined Woolworths Group as the people director for our retail ecosystem, which sees me partnering with a number of our enabling business units as we go through a very significant agile transformation across 
the group. Um, but I'm also working on our broader strategy to support that retail, retail ecosystem as well. So looking at how we transform Woolworths to be um, a retailer for the future as Woolworths moves into its second century, which is pretty extraordinary. So looking to make sure that we've got uh, the capability that we need, that we've got um, the investment in the right places that we need, but really importantly, that we've got that customer first, team first approach to make sure that uh, our team are absolutely well placed to be able to move into that second century uh, for Woolworths, a big focus on transformation uh, and the team experience. So aside from being a mum of two, one of whom has recently um, spent his first year playing for Sydney University in the under 12s rugby, uh, that's, that's pretty much me. Thank you so much, Trudy. That shift that you've described uh, towards change and transformation is so interesting. And mm -hmm. I'm sure our audience will want to hear more about that. So thank you so much. And welcome, Angus. Um, let's hear from Angus um, in terms of the subjects he studied and his career journey. Over to you, Angus. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. Hopefully you can all hear me. I, um, now where am I today? I'm on the central coast, but I think this, well, this is dark and John land here. So I'm in a different part of the country, I think almost every week at the moment. Um, so very, um, very privileged to be part of this today. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, look, I guess I'll, I'll start back university days. I, 89 was my first year. I did a year of arts, just scraped through with arts and decided that I need a little bit more direction. So transferred to education and did human movement. Um, not necessarily because I wanted to teach. It was more, for me, it was something that I was very interested in. I was playing a lot of sport at the time and it, it seemed to be um, something that I could see that was quite, I guess that gave me something that there was teaching at the end, but equally it, I saw it more as a generalist degree, um, not knowing what I wanted to do beyond that. I then joined the military after I finished university I did my first eight years uh, in the Navy at sea, driving guided missile destroyers, destroyer escort, patrol boats. Uh, I moved into a lot of work with boarding operations, so the Northern Australia and in, uh, in the Middle East. I then had an accident uh, whilst deployed and I had a couple of years off in that time, a very small family at that stage, took three years off to get myself right and did um, opened up a couple of gyms with a, with a mate of mine that I'd played rugby with. And then I went back into the military after that. So I did another eight years in, in a range of roles. I was a linguist, I did a couple of languages and spent probably the better part of the next eight years um, in various countries around the world. Um, and finally got out around about 12 years ago. Uh, and since that time, I went to uh, Sydney, Ports. I was the deputy hub master, so I looked after operations for the port of Botany in Sydney, which combined was the largest, um, the largest combined ports in the country. And then I moved on to New South Wales Maritime, and I headed up. That was part of RMS, and I spent a bit of time as the uh, as the acting CEO at RMS for a little bit of a period. And so that's a big workforce. So we had, I think, we we're about nine billion dollars spend and around eight and a half thousand workforce at the time. So that um, from engineers and the very technical side all the way through obviously legal and finance and um, policy, et cetera, in there as well. I then went up to Queensland uh, and I headed up the Queensland Maritime Safety. So we had 21 ports and that was a lot of, that time was over the COVID period as well. So responsible for shipping movements in and out of the 21 ports of Queensland through the Torres Strait, through the Barrier Reef, um, but also navigating COVID and getting ships in and cruise ships at the time uh, was a very interesting period for me. And it was that really, I guess, what really underpinned it was that necessity to be flexible and to be, I guess, outcome orientated, but in a very dynamic workplace and changing regulations, changing government expectations, you know, community expectations around being kept, uh, kept safe from what was very much an unknown threat of COVID coming in through the ports. Um, and you obviously everyone's aware of what happened in Sydney and the Ruby Princess and how, how that changed people's perceptions very quickly. And I did that for about two and a half years and I'm now a year into my new role and I'm the, the CEO and the Chief Commissioner of the ATSB. So we're 
a, it's on a statutory independent stat, statutory appointment from the federal government. And I have a team of investigators. I've got six officers around the country, seven officers around the country. And we investigate all aviation, maritime and rail incidents. We receive around about 9,000 notifications or incidents per year. And we choose about 60 to investigate. So it's really around systemic benefits um, in safety. So big planes, obviously at the top of our list move millions of Australians every year, every year, but equally around the economic consequences of trains derailing of the maritime, of incidents in the maritime space. Um, we've had a busy year this year. I think I'm on to our 11th aviation fatality, fatal accident this year. So I've got a lot of active investigations, maybe 90 active investigations on the book at the moment. And, and um, as I said, it's, it's a combination of very technical skill sets. So my investigators come from uh, aeronautical engineering backgrounds, pilot backgrounds, licensed aircraft mechanics, ships captains. But equally, I have a very strong academic element to, to our team. So I suspect outside of a university, I have a, the greatest number of uh, PhD graduates in my workforce because we have a lot of human factors elements that need to be accounted for in investigations. And it's around assessing a lot of evidence and putting weight to it and then writing a report that's justified, particularly when we come down to safety outcomes and safety issues. Um, there's not a judicial review beyond our investigation. So ours don't go to a court, ours are final. We have some very strong powers when it comes to gathering. I have coercive powers, much the same as you know, something like a Royal Commission. Um, but equally, I have to have a very strong academic product at the end of the day that is fully supported by the evidence. So it's been a fascinating year in this role. And I think you know, some of what I learned back at university very much has come to play. And I'm certainly happy to discuss that just around the mindset that becomes successful when I'm trying to manage and lead a team that's so diverse that I, I am at the moment. So thank you and thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much, um, Angus. And um, what a career journey you've had. Um, and the kind of last point that you've raised actually segues nicely into the, the really the first question that I'd like to pose to all of you, um, which is, um, what would you see um, as some of the core skills or capacities that your arts degree gave you um, to enable you to develop a particular approach to your career or employment or have served you well, maybe, in terms of your career journeys. So I'll throw that to Seamus, first of all. Over to you, Seamus. Yeah, wow. Um, <clears throat> so I think it has, um, it's played a lot, uh, I think, into, uh, into sort of my career story and, and, and how I think about it. I was sort of taking some notes down as I was listening with, uh, with Trudy and Angus. And I think, you know, one of the big things is around this, this adaptability and this, this flexibility, um, uh, this ability to be able to sort of face into ambiguity uh, without sort of terror striking you. And for me, you know, if I look at my, my, two, my two courses that I was going through um, in terms of uh, art history and, and literature, you know, both of these were really uh, fundamentally founded on, on critical thinking. Uh, and on being able to take an argument, to dissect an argument and come and arrive at first principles uh, of that. And then to be able to work out what are the myriad of ways that, can, that we can address this particular problem um, or what are the different arguments, um, you know, in the case of art and literature, um, uh, that, that we could use to, to address this. Now, when I think about that from a career standpoint as well and, and from the roles I take and even my role now, the ability to be able to see a business problem uh, that is coming up, um, uh, you know, how do we, how do we uh, tackle uh, this specific issue that we're seeing? Or how do we, you know, in the case of our company, how do we get in front of these farmers and what are the types of issues that they're dealing with? To be able to then dissect and pull that apart and say, okay, well, here are four or five possibilities. 
you know, in the parlance of business, we call these experiments, you know, from, from an academic standpoint, we call them arguments. And let's see which of these arguments, which of these experiments is actually going to be most effective in, in solving that. I think the, the, the other part of this, you know, for me was on, was on open-mindedness. So, um, you know, I spent a, a fair amount of time at Manning Bar when, when Manning Bar was, was there. But what the great thing about uh, Manning Bar was, it was bringing together a range of different disciplines. Um, and it would be about the debates and it'd be about the arguments across a, a variety of different topics. And I think for an art standpoint, the, flexible, uh, the flexibility in terms of allowing other people's opinions to come in and be able to morph and adapt your own has proved sort of time and time again for me to be uh, super important. Whether that's the shift from going from, you know, arts into, you know, specialist roles and specialist roles into business world or being able to kind of sit in a boardroom and hear from uh, you know, around the table, why something, you know, may or may not work, and to be able to adapt your own strategy accordingly. Uh, for me, I think that was a foundational part of, of, of having that, of having that arts mindset. Thank you. I mean, I love that idea of the arts approach to business problems, um, which is really kind of, um, uh, kind of distills um, some of the kind of real capabilities, I think, that an arts degree can give. Um, let's, uh, hear from Trudy. What, what's um, your take on this, Trudy? Yeah, look, I think there's some similar themes there. For me, even going into the um, economics with that bent toward social science degree, navigating the subjects that both interested me and I thought would be relevant to um, what my future might look like. I think even the independent need to to get in there and understand um, year by year or semester by semester, what I thought was going to make that recipe land in that space, you know, with the product that I would love at the end of it. I think there is something in that in terms of skill for the future, right? What do I need at a particular time in order to get me where I need to go? So I think you start to learn that um, in a social sciences degree quite early on. I've reflected a lot on my partner is a scientist and when I think about the nature of our study, there was very little in my degree that was black and white. And as, and I mentioned earlier, as society disruption happens rapidly, you know, that ability to navigate in the grey, that ability to understand both the black and white, but more importantly around the grey, um, is something that I think is, is very much a part of the degree when you're in that social science space. So I can distill it down into a reflection that is around the nature of the questions that are asked are usually relatively subjective. And, you know, when you think about the specificity of that, you need to interpret that question and that really leads to um, a depth of understanding of inquiry and it leads to that curiosity because a response in the social sciences in any assessment or in a tute or in a, you know, lecture is really going to be a black and white answer. And so how you then frame that answer, how you then seek to really get to the bottom of what the question is asking for or asking and how you piece that together in a way that the listener can understand is to me something that provides you with a real agility that you don't get necessarily in some of the more vocational disciplines where everything is um, much more mapped out for you. I think even in terms of the assessment Right. Again, that is something that comes down to the interpretation of, of the professor or the person who's working through. And so how you then respond to that and how you then steer yourself toward a better result next time is something that I've definitely taken with me in terms of particularly leadership positions, but also how I navigate through and support leaders in business as well, given a, a big chunk of my time is around exec coaching. Um, I can reflect on COVID, Lisa, and I think about some of the leaders that I saw really step up through that process because there was no map. Um, and Angus talked about, you know, some of the challenges there. There was no roadmap for COVID. We hadn't dealt with that situation before. And so what I did see is leaders step up, particularly where we had developed those kinds of skills from a relatively early age professionally because you're just used to adapting in that particular space right so I could see there was a certain 
um, leader in the space who'd done a very traditional degree and his career path had followed that very formulaic um, approach, I suppose. And you could see them really grappling for the answers because it wasn't there. It wasn't something they could Google and they could get the answer to or something that they'd learned off by heart. So for me, it's around versatility. It's around agility. It's around inquiry and it's around um, curiosity. That's terrific. And that kind of, I, I really like the way you've highlighted a kind of tolerance for being in the grey, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, living yeah. with the ambiguity, it's it's a hot spot right now. We, you know, if you think about leaders, particularly executive leaders across business in Australia and and globally, you know, there's an aspect that's resilient, but it's not. It's actually around the ability to navigate through. And, and Seamus talked to that as well around yeah. um, how you take that lens into solving business problems, right? Absolutely. Yeah, common themes there between yourself and Seamus. So thank you. What about for you, Angus? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Look, I guess I will say that that ambiguity is something that has been the hallmark of just about everything I've done. And even you know, going into a, to a military environment, you know, working in places like Iraq and, and Afghanistan and other parts of the Middle East, there isn't a defined roadmap of this is how this is how you're meant to um, to achieve your you know, your outcome or to to, um, to to progress what it is that you're there to do. It's very much around co collaboration. So if I would say that there's one skill set that I look at um, that underpins success, it's the ability to collaborate and that in good faith collaboration. So it is about developing trust. Um, and I say to my work folks, even small things, and sometimes you need to think around the brand that you're bringing in and what's that brand. And if it is collaboration, you know, being the first to be able to compromise. So being quite clear around that this is the, the outcome that you're looking for. And outcomes quite often are strategic outcomes, but understanding that there's multiple pathways there and no pathway is likely to be a perfect pathway. And that's where I think both Trudy and Chambers said around that ambiguity. Um, but it's it's being able to deal with people in good faith and that collaboration to to open yourself up that, that there's multiple pathways. And I guess I'm someone that does have quite a high appetite for risk. And that's not cavalier risk, but that's very much around you've got to embrace risk and you've got to bring others on with you because that's how you're going to make progress particularly in government environments, it's very easy to take a very policy line or a very risk adverse line. And COVID was one of those classic examples. And I saw it play out in so many areas where fortunately I had in Queensland, um, I just happened to have some powers available to me there under legislation that allowed me to, to, to really launch into some risk. And, and it came at you know, personal professional risk to me, but equally to the to the brand of the workforce. But I also managed to, to bring others along with me and said, well, look, the outcome that we're looking after, and this was around welfare of some of the seafarers that were servicing the ports. This was around keeping trade going and understanding that the, 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 the finances that sat underneath Queensland were very much trade orientated, that the outcomes were worth it. So whilst I didn't necessarily have, this is the, the pathway we have to take, and we kept modifying our pathway as we learned more, but it was around stepping into it and saying, well, look, this is the risk, this is the reward. I'm As long as I'm quite comfortable around if the worst plays out, what's the, what's the uh, implication? And let's talk about that. And then let's launch into a direction when we've found what's a, a good dance. So I think it's if there's one skill set I look at, and I certainly have throughout but in the last... 20 years, oh, sorry, the last 10 years, I guess I must have employed hundreds of people in different roles. You can buy in skill sets, you can buy in technical expertise, but it's very hard. Um, or the, the, the one that really is a predominant of success or an underlier of success is, can they navigate their ideas in the workplace? Can they, um, I guess, collaborate to get an outcome? And I think a generalist degree, like an arts type degree, does help underpin that because there is ambiguity and it's around gathering a lot of intelligence or a lot of evidence and then trying to make sense of it where it's not perfect and coming up with something at the end that's meaningful and workable 
and that for me, I guess, is is one of those skill sets that I would always look for um, in those that I choose to you know to work around. Thanks, Angus. And this appetite for risk that you've highlighted, which I think is really interesting, do you see that being enabled by the kind of art skill set? Um, is that something that you see a connection to? I think, look, I do. Um, and again, it's that risk is something that, as I said before, it's not a cavalier risk. It's a calculated risk, but nonetheless, yeah. it's a risk. So there is downsides and potentially there are some significant downsides. Um, and I've always thought around, in, particularly in my career, that, um, and I go back to that building the brand. If you, you think around the brand you want to promote and what pe you want people to know you for, and it, ev everyone will be slightly different there. And some it's really around that technical expertise um, but it's equally around when you leave an organisation, people will remember you, and I guess there's nothing new to your audience here, around the environment that you created, you know, how you made people feel, how you empowered other people. Yes, you've got a job to do and you've got to, you know, you've got to achieve certain outcomes because that's what you're paid to do, but it's the way in which you bring others around you. And sometimes you know, when you empower staff, it comes at a risk. Now, I've got staff that have a very different experience base to me and, and in some case, probably less of an experience base in some areas. Now, it's very easy for me to dominate over and say, well, this is the way I want it done because I know this works. But that's not what people remember. It's around empowering people to make decisions and knowing that, yes, it's not going to be the way that I necessarily would like it. So there was a risk to it. But equally, the outcome and the reward is going to be far greater because I've brought a staff base on or I've brought those colleagues with me on a journey, which is probably the way that we manage the journey is going to be the dependent on how successful it is, not necessarily that we've micromanaged it to a point that we don't introduce any risk. And I guess that's just the, I guess the philosophy that I find. And you spend yeah. a lot of time at work. You want to enjoy it and you want to enjoy it for those that you work with as well. Agreed. So um, let me pose that the question that I've just asked in a slightly different way, which hopefully our audience will find um, helpful and interesting. If you were to distill um, the arts um, skill set, if you like, into keywords, um, what would those keywords be? Um, so let me turn to Seamus. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll probably pilfer a few from, from what have we heard from, uh, from Angus and Trudy as well. Look, I mean, I think we spoke about a couple of themes there. Um, you know, there was the, the versatility, um, I think curiosity that, that Trudy was talking about, which is, uh, you know, fantastic and, and flexibility from, from what Angus was talking about. Um, and for me, that the, the, the flexibility is, um, once again, and that's sort of that, that open-mindedness that ability to be able to take on um, thoughts from others and to be able to adapt um, your own way of thinking uh, in accordance with that. Not to say that uh, you need to concede to someone. It's not about just blindly taking what they've said and going with it, but rather being able to shift your own mindset um, uh, and take the best blend of those two things forward with you into the next thing. Wonderful. Thank you, Seamus. How about you, Trudy? What would your keywords yeah, be? Yeah, I feel like I kind of talked a little bit to that, but, I, but just distilling it again, reflection is something that I think I took away from my degree and there's something that's really resonated with me more recently and that's around holding the pause, how quickly in business we look to jump to conclusions um, and I think being able to reflect and hold that pause is critical. Curiosity for me, growth mindset is is still pretty fashionable, but I think it's really fashionable for a reason. Um, and it is something where I think broad-based degrees lend themselves naturally to that. The last one is agility. It's that self-learning piece that I was talking to as well. It's not having things laid out for you prescriptively. It's needing to be able to navigate. So agility um, is, you know, if I can think about the one thing I need to focus on with coaching leaders at the moment, it is very much around that. So that's my three, reflection, curiosity, agility. 
That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Trudy. How about you, Angus? What would be your three? Uh, I think being passionate. Um, because if, if you're passionate to begin with, then you're, you're constantly looking at how to add value to something, not simply how to go about and, and, and do what's within your, your job description or your position description. It's, it's figuring out that value can be added in a lot of different methods. It's the, the technical expertise, it's the collaboration that you can bring, it's around the environment that you're creating by the way that you interact with people because that's, they're the workforces that people thrive in, where they're supportive and there's high morale and there's high trust levels and there's, um, I guess, that sense of ownership. And that comes not just from the top down, but equally from the bottom up, and that's everyone has a responsibility and is accountable to that. So I would say be, um, be passionate and have hold your position passionately. Um, but equally, and when I mentioned before around that, and I think Trudy sort of talked around being agile as well, for me, being agile is uh, sometimes it's being able to compromise on the areas that, um, while still maintaining the goal, but that agility to not necessarily be locked into the, the pathway to get there and listening to others and taking risks along the way um, is, I think, is the workforce that I really enjoy working in. And it's the one that you know, you've got to actively work at. It doesn't just happen. Everyone has to understand that they have a role in building that type of a work environment. It's so interesting that you're kind of converging in terms of the skill set, even though you work in really different fields. Um, and there's this kind of, there's a common narrative and I especially like the way that you're pointing to a kind of non-structured transition. We, historically, we've thought about careers and work in a particular kind of way, but you're thinking about it much more in terms of curiosity, passion, being agile and so on. Um, and this is so, so helpful, I hope, for our audience, um, some of whom I'm sure are kind of thinking about how to launch their own careers. Um, so let's turn to our um, next question, which is obviously we live in incredibly disrupted times, um, whether we think about COVID, climate change, inflation rate rises, um, uh, peculiar things to Australia, such as, you know, um, House prices going south in major cities, which is causing a lot of anxiety. There's a really tight labour market at the moment. Um, and those things, I think, you know, I think you've all pointed to this in different ways. They require us all in certain ways to be um, agile and adaptive. So in your experience, um, in what ways do you think arts degrees serve graduates well in terms of navigating this kind of major set of external disruptions. So I'll throw that one to Seamus first. Thanks, Seamus. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, I mean, look, I think it's it's entirely correct to say that these are sort of unprecedented times. Um, uh, certainly no major disruptions like uh, what we've seen with COVID have taken place. I can't think of many historical events, maybe barring the Spanish flu where the entire world kind of shut down for a time. Uh, and even then, I, I, I don't think it would have shut down in the way that it has done. Um, look, I, we've already talked about adaptability in terms of um, uh, the openness to be able to move to something new. So, so I'll just park on, on, on that side for a moment. I think um, Angus touched on this, which is, you know, arts is a very um, broad spectrum degree. Uh, and even within, you know, whether it's education or, or, uh, or in economics, uh, or even in sort of art history and literature, et cetera, you often do additional subjects uh, as you go along as well. Um, and why I bring that up is I think that there is a lot of mental safety in that knowledge that actually you have, you come up with a broad spectrum of knowledge. And that means that you're not going to be pigeonholed into, into one particular thing. Now, why I talk about that is, for me, I think the, the greater threat of COVID is actually that which is still to come, which is the rapid acceleration of automation uh, with inside workplaces and digitization. 
Uh, and with that, you're going to find a lot of jobs which were, uh, you know, to Trudy's earlier point, the black and white type of answer are actually going to be kind of left out in the cold because it's becoming a necessity to be able to do these things in a leaner fashion or to be able to do these things in an automated fashion uh, or at the very least remotely, which then opens up a much larger you know, potential talent pool that comes in. And for me, I think the beauty of arts is it becomes quite difficult to automate many of these art subjects because there is that level of subjectivity that comes in. It is that ability to have um, you know, that affinity mapping, to be able to pull those different things together and say, well, actually, you know, one plus two is more likely to equal 10 because of X, Y, Z reason, rather than needing to follow that linear path. So whilst, you know, I, I don't know if an arts degree is the perfect shield uh, in, you know, against COVID or against kind of the, the, the economic downturn that, that we've had, certainly for me, I think it's, it's really preparing for what's to come next, which is COVID kind of kicked off this a dramatic change in the way that we work and the way that we think about work and arts provides that sort of that solid foundation to be able to uh, move into different territories and face into that ambiguity in ways that potentially other degrees uh, don't allow you to. Well, that's a great answer, Seamus. And I love your example around automation and the kind of surplus to automation, the thing that can't be captured which is embodied in many ways in the arts disciplines. Um, that's a, a wonderful um, way to think about um, our external disruptions at the moment. So let's see what um, Trudy's thoughts are on this. Yeah, no, that's a good one. It's a build for me, I think, um, because there's some similar themes. I, I'm at the moment starting to create counsel, my teenager, and we can often start with this conversation around what can a machine not do. So I think that piece that Seamus was reflecting on is a really, really interesting one. Because if you think about um, broad-based degrees, arts, et cetera, that, that lack of a linear pathway that you follow through that degree, like I said, even from the subject selection itself, as you start to navigate through, you're learning those skills of independence around what you need to do to be able to iterate. So you start that quite early on in the process. You know, there are not the grad programs that are necessarily um, curated in that cookie cutter way that there can be for things like accounting or, you know, other, other disciplines as well. And so you start at a very early point thinking about contextually where you think you're going to add the most value and where you'll get the most enjoyment as well. So we probably haven't talked a lot about that today, but I think increasingly there's that focus on how we create that balance and how we actually enjoy what we do as well. And, and for a lot of us, enjoyment will come from variety and it will come from that ability to continuously learn and not feel that you're put in that box um, that Seamus mentioned as well. So reflections for me is knowledge is democratised now to such a point. Digitisation has impacted us to such a point that things that I would have learnt by Roche in the couple of subjects that I did, you know, 20 years ago, they became redundant really quickly, right? But the things that I take with me are how I continue to learn, how I pursue that inquiry, how I ask those questions to get to the bottom of. And as I said, through COVID, there hasn't been that roadmap. And so the people who I think have risen to the top through this period are those people who take that broad-based view and who can leverage skill sets across a number of different spaces. And unfortunately, in the role that I've been, uh, that I've been in for most of my career, when I talk about change and, and transformation, a lot of what we're addressing is the capability needs that we need moving forward, and that can lead to redundancies. And sitting in those rooms where you're looking to redesign and you're thinking about the skills, the capabilities and, you know, effectively the people that you need in the roles that you need them in to adjust to what our customers are looking for at that particular time, you know, you're very rarely in a situation where a generalist isn't going to come out on top, right? If there's, if there's a choice between somebody who has a very narrow skill set and experience compared to somebody who has some breadth, you'll take the person with breadth every time because from a corporate perspective in particular, you know, and, and, and Angus talked about this as well from a leadership perspective, the best leaders are the leaders who've had that breadth of experience, right, who can empathise in a way that creates that personalised experience for people. And I think what I do see from people with strong generalist backgrounds 
is that ability to empathise and that ability to support people through career changes in a way that you don't see necessarily in those more formulaic career pathways that have been really heavily disrupted, right, um, based on all the factors that Seamus was talking about, digitisation being that primary one. So um, I think that just brings me back to that what can a machine not do? And I think when I go through with my daughter <laughs> around those degrees, you know, the, the reality is that a lot of the emphasis then becomes on those humanities, right, because it's asking the questions and it's being able to empathise and create those experiences, those leadership experiences that we can't digitise at the moment. That's a, a wonderful title for a book, What Can a Machine Not Do? Um, <laughs> and, you know, all of this is, I think, for the, our audience is, I, I hope it's really empowering for them because, you know, the idea of a broad-based arts degrees, degree which delivers this kind of change mindset, empathy mindset, and so on. Um, you know, hopefully the audience is hearing this is, this is what employers are looking for right now. Um, so that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Trudy. Let's hear, uh, hear from Angus. Thanks, Angus. Yeah, thank you. And, and I want to touch on in a minute uh, on what Trudy said around that empathy, because I think that is a, a real skill set there too. And when we talk in my workplace, I say, you know, I want a contested workplace. I want people who are really passionate and who are willing to put some real academic rigour to, to their position and to their argument. Um, and then on that flip side, I said, but for it to actually make any effect, you've got to do it with manners. And when I talk about manners, I say it is around understanding how it's going to be perceived, understanding that others will look at it differently, and that's okay. And how you co collaborate and how you navigate that through that is going to be the determinant of whether you're successful or not. And that empathy becomes a really important part because it's realising that, you know, I know in my, I said in my workplace at the moment, I have from those very technical engineers to those with you know, their um, deep understanding of human factors, they're at the different ends of a spectrum. And to try and get a workforce that does have a big chunk of them very much at one end of a spectrum to another, it requires that skill set of uh, in good faith collaboration and understanding that your goal as a leader, but as a, a participant, is to get the most out of someone else as well. And they're going to look at it differently to you. So you're going to have to, and I think about that leadership by exception, I treat everyone differently because everyone needs a different type of motivation or needs to be heard slightly differently. But going back to your initial point, I think, and I think Seamus, when, when you first talked around this time of, you know, um, whether it's unprecedented because of COVID and interest rates and et cetera, for me, it's been the most exciting two or three years because it's full of opportunities. Uh, and I think coming from a military background, I've worked in 15 or 16 different countries um, and that sat down and you know, in dirt floors in Afghanistan, trying to navigate through a situation or get an outcome to sitting around with, um, with leaders in Paris, for instance. And again, it's, it's different. It's understanding that there's opportunities on all of them how am I going to add the most value? What are people looking for? And I think Trudy touched on it when she talked around the customers. It's, it's looking at, and for COVID for me, because there was a lot of uncertainty and I was in Queensland at the time with shipping, there was government expectations that were quite defined. There was a community that was really at angst. And so I had to address community concerns in isolated ports particularly in isolated communities up in places like Mackay or but even further up when they had the Indigenous communities that were really concerned around cruise shipping in the very early stages. Um, so I had to have a different approach for the Torres Strait than I did for, Queen, for Brisbane, for instance, because I had the economics there was something that was really important, but equally navigating with you know, your Rio Tintos that had the mine up in the top of Queensland Again, getting supply chains, I had to look at all of those different ports through a different lens, which meant I could add value. I could really go and look at what did someone, what did this community or this business want? How can I deliver to it? What risks am I willing to take to get the best outcome? 
but how am I going to bring everyone on board with me? So, and I really sold it to my team in around the, the, the state there that this is a time for us to, in, to really build and enforce our brand. And our brand is collaboration, it's problem solving, um, it's listening. And there's no better environment than through a crisis. Um, and, you know, as I think Winston Churchill said, never waste a crisis. Um, and if you can really understand what people want, well, then you're likely to be able to deliver to it if you're willing to, to work with others and take some risks. So I think that your answer truly embodied um, Angus Trudy's principle around change mindsets, um, you know, embracing the crisis, looking at each different situation, not in a standardized way, um, but in a unique way. So that was a, a wonderful response. So thank you so much. So that we have about five minutes left um, and we've got a few questions that have come in from the audience. Um, one of those is what factors or thoughts led you to change your jobs or organisations in your career path? So, Could you say um, that again, Lisa? Yeah, so this question is from Alana um, and has asked what factors or thoughts led you to change your jobs or organizations in your career journeys? So what were the prompts? <laughs> yeah, I'm really clear about that one, so I'm happy to start. <laughs> um, with all of my career changes, it actually goes back to that principle I was talking about around what I felt was stretching me at that particular time. Um, and I do actually think it goes back a little bit to even, you know, uni days around thinking through what subjects I thought were going to be that appropriate tool in my toolkit um, to make me both happy and, and, you know, fulfilled and feeling like I've got that sense of achievement as well. So I think for me, every career change or every role change or career change, every company change, because I've largely stayed within the same um, discipline or, or profession has been driven by that need to um, test myself in different scenarios or situations and look to apply what I had learnt in a different context and so for me it's 90% of the time it's been about learning I think the other is is like many people there are times where in industry um, there may be aspects that you don't enjoy as much as others and you know I've gone through periods where I've enjoyed working in um, cost transformation oriented businesses and and then you know I've, I've maximized I suppose or, or worked out that muscle a little bit too much and then it's time to move into something more growth oriented as well but I think again it's around finding that balance between what you enjoy but what is continuing to stretch you and and help you learn as well. Yeah I love the emphasis on learning how about for you Seamus? Yeah, I, I think a lot of similarities, I guess, Trudy and I must have done the same degree. Um, the, I, I think this, this necessity to keep stretching yourself um, and to, you know, we talked on, on growth mindset um, just a little bit before, but maybe this is an arts thing, maybe not, but the sort of the, the hunger to know a little bit more, right? And, and to expand, you know, in what some people might call like your knowledge corridor, your ability to be able to pull these disparate things together, but you need to have more disparate things in there to be able to draw from as you're going along. Um, certainly I've always left positions when kind of I was hitting very good strides inside an organization when I felt like, I could easily sit there and I could continue to do exceptionally well and that might be kind of the path forward or to take a calculated risk at that point in time uh, when already I knew that I had that solid foundation in place and I was already doing very well to then go okay well what's what's next what's the next you know not just incremental change but what's the next step change in terms of uh, in terms of career in terms of career path for me um, you know the, I, I think that, I think you can get complacent. I think that you can you can sit in a career for too long and and you can you can kind of just do it because it's the thing there. But if you're not if you're not feeling as Angus talked about passionate uh, about what you're doing, then that very quickly becomes actually a negative element in terms of your life. We can't you know you can't spend 
you know, whatever hours you happen to be working, but it's certainly going to be at least as, as least as much, if not more than the time you're going to spend with friends and family. You can't spend that uh, just doing something that you're not enjoying because then you're living, you know, the majority of your life in an unpleasant state in a very small amount in a, in a pleasant state. I'm much more happy if I can, uh, much happier if I can be in a position that I'm really loving uh, and being stretched in and learning and it might not be forever, or it might be for X amount of time until I feel like I've kind of hit that next stride before it's time to take the next. But that's certainly been a big motivating factor for me. Thank you so much. So being stretched, learning, being passionate. So those are the kind of messages I've heard. I was hoping to turn to Angus, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I want to thank our wonderful panel. Um, I've certainly um, learned a great deal and I hope the audience have as well and I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today in our webinar. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up post event and hope that, um, hope that you can join us for our second webinar, webinar in this series. So thanks once again and um, wishing you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.